Okay, and we're back. I've run the uh, iterating clip tool on our overall data set. And what I want you to notice, when you do it, you're going to see the model process uh, dialog here. And I want to scroll up through it. And it's a good idea to, to leave this uh, so that you understand what's going on in your model. And you'll notice that, in fact, it tells you what's going on. And a couple things that I want to point out. First of all, normal process ran here. And we can see that it actually created its start time, end time. Reading features, cracking. And then now this is the one that I want you to pay attention to. Notice it says warning. Empty output generated. Well, anytime you use an iterator across a large number of data sets, it's possible that something in uh, your data sets may not, in fact, be within the clipping boundary. And that's what happened here. We had a feature class that simply produces an empty uh, output. And that's fine. Uh, a warning is usually not a big deal. It's when there's a general error and, it in fact, stops the model. But in this case, that's not the case. So we can close that now. And what I want to point out are two things. So we're going to go back to my catalog, and this is my clip output. And you'll notice that for each one of these, let me move this over so you can see the full name, it says the original name, AML inventory points, but then it's added to the end, overall study clip. And so again, we've used our inline substitution and then that end piece of data. The other thing I want you to note is that when you look at your model, you'll notice that all of the processes now have shadows underneath them. What that means is that the model has been run. And in order to use the model again, you want to use the uh, validate tool. And we're going to click on that. And what it does is it sets the model back to a runnable condition. Now, what we're going to do here is this is why we actually do models, is that we had a lot of things that we would have had to clip by manually one at a time. And now what I want to do is I'm going to take our clip and I'm going to change a couple of the parameters here. So since we've already run it on our overall area, I'm going to actually change that to our smaller area. And so I've changed the... Uh, Oh, and again, we have, so here's our inputs. Okay, they're going to stay the same because we want to start with our raw data. But now I've changed the clip feature to be just that small area in the uh, northeast section of the study. And then what I want to do here is change the name that's coming out. And I don't have to change anything other than the information after the inline substitution. So now I'm going to call these SR clip. Because remember, these are clipped by that very small area that's just the branch of the Slippery Rock Creek. Now again, once I've done that, I can hit Apply and OK. And what you're going to notice is now here in our model, that original clip feature is now no longer attached to the process. And if, you, if I grab just that, I can move it out of the way. I'm going to delete it because I don't need it anymore. And again, we now have our tool in a runnable state, if you will. And right now, you'll notice that the output name has changed. So now I can run it again. And we'll let this run. It won't take very long. This is a fairly quick um, iterator. Again, you'll notice right there was an empty output. There's probably going to be more of those because it's a smaller area. You'll notice that in some cases, polygons get cracked. And while this is running, I want to make a point. Clipping point features is really not the way this is normally done, at least interactively. Um, normally, point features are selected by location. But when you're running a model, you can, in fact, clip point features. And it's an equivalent of extracting by location. And so again, if in the past, you may have learned that we clip line and polygon features, and we select by location points. And yes, that is true, but when you're running an iterator or a large model, it's just as efficient to put all of them into the same place. So now our model's done. I'm going to click Close. And again, what we always want to do with this is we're going to reset our model. And we're going to save our model. And in this case, I'm going to save this to my project toolbox. And in this case, I'm going to call it a clip model. And we're going to save that. The other thing I want to do in this case, because I don't want this just to run automatically, and the things that typically would be what I would want the user to define are going to be the input geodatabase. So I'm going to right click on that and make that a model parameter. And notice a little P appears there. That means the user is going to have to define that parameter. 
I also want them to have to define the clip feature. So I'm going to put a P there. And I want them to have to name the output. So I've put that there. So now when I save it, I'm going to open this one so you see what happens. I now have three parameters that need to be set by the user. So when they run this, that's what they're going to need to see. So again, we're going to close this. We've run our tools. And if we look at this, I'm going to add our toolbox back in. And we should see here's our Project 1 toolbox. We saved that model. Okay, and so we'll see in just a moment. The Project 1 should appear here. And when we look at that model now, instead of editing, if I open that, you'll notice that all three of those things that I just defined as parameters are actually listed here. The input data, the clip data, and the output. So here's our geodatabase etc. So again, that's what we're going to do and that's how we can use this model uh, in the future. Now, later on we'll learn how to comment out this so that the inputs are defined better. You'll notice here they simply take the previous names. But that's all there is to this. We'll see you next time when we talk about uh, calculating densities.